Hello, I'm Chancellor Holden Thorpe. Some of our nation's brightest entrepreneurs have been on campus here at Carolina this week. I had a chance to talk innovation and much more with two of them, Steve Case and Desh Deshpande. Well, each of you guys have uh, had unbelievable entrepreneurial careers, and we've got lots of students here. So could you tell us a little bit, each tell us a little bit about sort of your first venture and what that was like and how you kind of, what you learned and how you got the bug to keep doing it? You start? Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be here. It's a, you know, obviously UNC is a great institution and Chapel Hill is a wonderful city, although I, I must admit uh, right off the top I'm here under some duress because my daughter plays for the Stanford soccer team <laughs> and UNC is their big rival. So I, 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 I told her I was coming here and uh, she thinks I'm, I'm penetrating enemy territory. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get some secrets to take <laughs> yeah. back to Stanford. Anyway, it's great to be here, uh, and Holden's done a, a, a terrific job uh, both at this institution and has been a great assistance with the, our efforts in D.C. to try to shine a spotlight on, on entrepreneurship and innovation and really get the, the nation rallying around entrepreneurs and celebrating the work they do and trying to accelerate the growth of more startups and particularly speed ups. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, and obviously the topic tomorrow is, is that. In terms of my first startup, I guess technically my first one was when I was you know, 10 or 11 years old, like, like many people did all kinds of, you know, silly little businesses, you know, selling things door to door and, you know, newspaper route and, and uh, so forth. My, my first significant entrepreneurial business after I graduated from college and went to uh, Procter & Gamble for a couple of years and PepsiCo for about a year, but all the while I was really fascinated with the, with the idea of what become the internet. Actually, the internet wasn't even commercial until the year these college students started, which mm -hmm. was 1992, the first, you know, the first decade we were working on it, it was actually illegal to connect a commercial online service to the internet. It was at the time just limited to educational institutions and, and government. So, and I remember spending several years trying to convince PC manufacturers to build P modems into PCs because we said someday people want to actually connect these devices to other devices and people. And in the 80s, people thought that was a little, a little far-fetched. Uh, but the first, the first venture uh, I got involved in after those companies was uh, in 1983, I moved to Washington, D.C., a, a company called Gameline. Uh, and since most people didn't have PCs at the time, uh, but they did have Atari video game machines. And I'm sure some of you remember the Atari VCS was, you know, kind of asteroid in some of those games. Um, and the idea was you'd plug a, a communications modem into the Atari device uh, and essentially turn it into an interactive terminal. It seemed like a great idea to me. Uh, so I, you know, left these big companies and went to this little company, and six months later it was a disaster. We were this, we were looking at the sales statistics after the first kind of Christmas season, one of the venture capitalists, Frank Coffer, who founded a company called Kleiner Perkins Coffer Buyers, looked at this sales statistics and said, "You'd have thought they would have shoplifted more than that." <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty much the end of that company, but. <laughs> But thank, I learned a lot there, and thankfully, I and two other people I met there ended up starting AOL, you know, not two years later in 1985. But like many entrepreneurs, you know, a lot of it was just, you know, perseverance and sticking with, with your idea, even though there's, you know, a lot of ups and downs, and often more downs than ups, but eventually, kind of, you can break through. Yeah. Well, when I was 12, I probably didn't know anything about entrepreneurship. I, uh, you know, grew up in India like probably several faculty members here. I did my master's, taught for a year, then did PhD. I really thought I was gonna be a professor. And, uh, but then there was a, this was all in Canada. Uh, and in Toronto, there was a, a young company, a technical company that could actually do 9,600 bits per second on a phone line. That was like really, really high tech. But the company wasn't doing that well, so the head of engineering, Peter Brackett, he, had to quit the company and come and teach in the same place where I was doing my PhD. So I got to know Peter really well. So Motorola came and bought that little company in Toronto. And then I, uh, uh, so Peter called me up and said, hey, forget all this professorial stuff. Why don't you just come here? So I went and joined him in Toronto in 1980. And over the next four years, uh, it went from 20 people to 400 people, $100 million business, very profitable. So that was my first taste of a startup. But then, you got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all Motorola, right? right. <laughs> and, and so uh, we said, hey, this could be a lot of fun if we could do this on our own. But the only two places where there was any venture capital at that time was Boston and California. So we moved to Boston in 84. And, uh, and it was pretty naive for a young couple to move in and say, I'll start a company. But it took about 
three years to get the green card in 87. Um, you know, those days, venture guys uh, would not fund you unless you went without a salary at least for a year. And so we had saved up enough money that I quit my job and we, uh, and, and a year later, we actually got funded, you know. Uh, we raised money from Seven Rosen and T Associates and so on. But unfortunately, about three months after we raised the money, I and my partner had a difference of opinion. And so I actually uh, let the other person run that company and I left. That was sort of the, the low point, you know, where we're probably just a, a couple of months away from being thrown out of the house and all the typical entrepreneurial near-death experiences. Uh, but fortunately, I, I got funded to do next company, Cascade Communications, where the idea was that I knew people like Steve would, would, would pump enough traffic into the public networks and, and the whole cascade was all about you know, connecting every computer to every other computer and doing these packet switches for the carriers, the Verizons and Sprints and everybody else and, 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 and that became a successful company. Fantastic, and you, know, you said a little bit about the sort of personal troubles that a lot of startups have. Um, you know, I, I usually tell people when, when really smart people come to me with an idea for a company, which if they're at Carolina, there's a decent chance that it's a good idea that the main struggles uh, in terms of whether they're going to succeed have to do with human beings interacting with each other more than the, mm. the idea. Can, can you each comment on that a little bit? You, well, you know, I, I think it's very rare that you'll ever see a company be successful without that sort of near-death experience. and and and. And so, but then what happens is, you know, I, I grew up in a very middle class family where, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that can go wrong in your life is that maybe your coffee is a little cold in the morning, you know? So, uh, so actually going through an experience like that, uh, what it does is sort of broadens your comfort zone. You know, you sort of go through it and you say, is this all there is to it, you know? And, and so I think that sort of expands your comfort zone. And almost every entrepreneur I know always goes through that experience. And, and, and then you say, hey, this is a lot of fun. I mean, this is not really as scary as people make it out to be. And, uh, well, it's some, it also depends on the nature of what you're trying to do. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to, to build companies, um, and you know, they're all terrific. You know, where I've tended to focus, uh, my time is really on these somewhat more challenging uh, ideas that actually are riskier and take longer to, to mm -hmm. kind of see fruition, uh, usually a decade or more, but ultimately you have the opportunity to you know, have a, build a significant company, you know, try to change the world. That's really the, you know, the, the focus we've always you know, had built. You know, even the Revolution and the Case Foundation have the same mission, which is invest in people and ideas that can change the world. So it's not you know, looking for the, the easy bunt or single, you're kind of swinging for the fences and some, you know, Babe Ruth was the home run king, he also was the strikeout king. So it goes with the territory that you're gonna you know, take on a lot of risk. But you also have to understand that some of these ideas just sometimes take a while. I was talking about you know, AOL, it really took us a decade before we hit our stride. You know, we, we mentioned the, the game line kind of situation, which was kind of a disaster. So we started in 1985 AOL. In 1992, we went public. We're the first internet company to go public. We've been at it for seven years. We had 187,000 subscribers after seven years. And so when we're on the road show and explain to people the internet, why you know, most people looked at us like, well, only 187,000 people you know, have bought into this thing. Why do you think it's someday gonna be a, a big deal? Now, seven years later, we had like 20 million. So it just, but it took a while before we kind of broke through. Companies were involved in now like a, you know, a Zipcar. You know, it started more than a decade ago took a while to build the model and the, you know, you kind of get the things down. Now it's you know, growing you know, quite nicely. But some of these ideas take a while, and you just kind of have to have the perseverance. To, another one that we're involved in now in the D.C. area is a good example of this. It's in an area called Social Commerce, a company called Living Social that sends out a, kind of a daily deal email. This company a year ago had 30 employees. Now they have over 1,000 employees, and it's really taken off. But the idea was tried 15 years ago. Paul Allen, one of the founders of Microsoft, pretty smart guy, funded a company doing sort of a similar thing, and it failed. The market just wasn't quite ready for it. So it was a good idea, but the timing wasn't right for it. And now companies like Living Social and the other major one, Groupon, are growing like gangbusters because things kind of align. So sometimes if you have an idea and you really believe in it, you've got to figure out some way to survive and stay in the game until that idea flourishes. It's not always that you've got to just hit the 
hit the ground running and you know, it's an instant success, it's much more likely as something that is many, many years of, of hard work and, and, and lots of near-death experiences. And Dash, through your center at MIT, there's been a lot of work on this kind of entrepreneurial behavior thing. How do you, how do you tell really smart college professors that uh, it's not just the science and that they have to do what Steve just said, which is position themselves to catch a break? Well, actually, it's two separate things, I think. One is sort of coming up with an idea that can change the world. Another one is to actually make it happen, right? And, and I think a lot of times professors confuse that. You know, coming up with an idea is very different than being the entrepreneur who actually makes it all happen. Sometimes professors think that they're entrepreneurs. Somehow tenure and entrepreneurship, they don't go together, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and I think, so the center at MIT is all about getting people to innovate in a way so that their idea has relevance to the world and could possibly have an impact. But after the professor comes up with an idea, you need an entrepreneur who then has to cross maybe a thousand bridges, right? It, it's, a, it's a long process. But I, th I think the, the, the center is, is all about moving the innovation process. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, the engineers came up with ideas and they designed the whole product. And then they hired sales and marketing to actually peddle the products. That's, that was the practice. You'd never do that in engineering today. The best research in universities today is roughly where engineering was 50 years ago. They come up with the idea, the best among them will go and, and uh, get a patent, and then the technology licensing office will peddle it. I mean, this is not totally true with everybody. In order of, let's say, 1,000 faculty in MIT, there's probably about 50 who couldn't care less. They're the Nobel Prize kind of guys. So they're really not worried about impact and so on, right? I mean, you have to leave them alone. And then out of the 1,000, there's probably about you know, 15, 20 people who are so good in, in already creating impact with their work that they don't need any help. So the center at MIT works on the people in between who have a huge desire to have an impact, but they don't quite know how to do it. Because what happens is that if you go talk to a faculty and graduate students, very first time they get an idea, they have this huge desire to have an impact on the world. There's no lack of desire. But if you go talk to them again in two months, they will have 10 more ideas because that's their business. Their business is coming up with all these ideas. And then, so the whole secret is, is how do they pick and choose which idea to pursue? And today what happens is that they pick an idea based on their peers, you know, NIH, DOD, but they're all professors. So they very quickly get into the business of impressing each other as opposed to having the big impact in the world. Not in a negative way, but just the clubby nature of the, the society, right? So connecting innovators and graduate students to relevance is, is very similar to connecting engineers to the customers as they design the product. So when you connect the faculty and the graduate students to the relevance in terms of what, where possibly this idea could have an impact, then they tend to pick and choose the paths which are more likely that when they get it done, that'll have a bigger impact on the world. So it's just increasing the probability of their work actually having either societal or economic impact on the world. But that doesn't make them an entrepreneur. They're just getting to the point where they generate the idea. And then typically it's the graduate student who becomes an entrepreneur or somebody else becomes an entrepreneur, picks up that idea, and then actually builds the company. Mm -hmm. And this, I, this execution, as Des said, really matters. I mean, there are a lot of people who have, have different ideas, but not that many people actually figure out a way to you know, make them into you know, kind of real sustainable you know, products or services or, or companies. And you know, Thomas Edison, one of the great entrepreneurs and uh, inventors 100 years ago had a great line, which was vision without execution is hallucination. It just, it just you know, it's, it's nice to have this vision, but if you can't figure out a way to make it work, and, and in the area of sports, you know, every NFL team, if there is any more NFL team, but <laughs> yeah, every NFL team has the same vision. They want to win the Super Bowl. Duh. Right. You know, the execution is what, how they feel the team and what plays they do and how they organize the system so that they have a better chance as opposed to, you know, less good chance of things. So execution, you know, really matters, and I think people often don't focus, and it's hard, and, it, and it, it's a, it's a you know, struggle usually over a long, you know, long period of time, and that's where there's a winnowing process of 
people thought, oh, I thought this was easy, or I thought it would be an overnight success, or, or even with AOL, it eventually was, as I said, it was, was quite successful. But a lot of people two, three years into it said, yeah, maybe it's not coming, yeah, it's not, not really working, maybe I should go back to whatever I was doing, or you know, there's a natural kind of winnowing process, and the real entrepreneurs are the ones who, or, you know, just they, they, they just so believe in that idea, they just you know kind of just won't let, won't let go of it. Even sometimes when it's a little irrational, and people are saying it doesn't look like this is going to happen, and and eventually they break through. And, and so Steve Dash has talked a little bit and done a lot about how universities can can do more in this area. What what do you, how do you kind of connect what he just said well, with, I, with what you're I saying? To, I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree with what he's saying, and obviously it's some it's some of the work you're trying to to lead on. There is a lot of of great ideas that are hidden, and in some cases beyond great ideas, great technologies that are hidden, and the question is how to unearth them and get them, you know, kind of into the, the real world, if you will, and have, having real impact and, and build real companies on it. And the amount of money that we spend as a, as a country on uh, research, the return we get for it is not what it should be, and we need to figure out smarter ways to, to kind of commercialize that and, and kind of connect the dots between these ideas and, 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 and the, the scientists are coming up with these ideas in many cases and entrepreneurs who can really run with, with ideas. Right now it happens in a somewhat, you know, obviously there's some places it happens better than other places, but a somewhat haphazard kind of anecdotal, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of a serendipitous sort of way as opposed to a more structured, sustained, you know, kind of way. Mm -hmm. you've, you've both uh, talked about changing the world and you've certainly directed a lot of your philanthropic efforts to to social innovation. We seem to have, you know, Mike Porter just wrote a big piece in the Harvard Business Review about shared value and uh, people are talking about the four benefit sector as a new sector of the economy. Um, what do you, and I think there's more and more appreciation for business and, and, the, and, and government working together for, for good. Tell me a little bit about your philosophy in terms of Sustainable enterprise and philanthropy and entrepreneurship and how those things all go together. You start. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I, th I think the um, in 2000 when we started this center at MIT. So the idea behind the MIT is that innovation plus relevance is equal to impact. That is, MIT has a lot of innovation, but that innovation does not have an impact on the world unless you direct that new idea to some burning problem in the world, and then you create the impact. So about six years ago, I and my wife, we said, well, what can we do about this in India? And, and the first reaction was to go do the same thing in a school that we both went to the same IIT, so we thought we'd do the same thing. But somehow doing nanotechnology in India wasn't that exciting. So we said, let's do the same thing, but do it for social innovation. And, and so there, people who live in the area who have huge problems, they have relevance. They know exactly what the problems are but they don't have innovation. So just like we brought relevance to MIT, we brought innovation to this particular project. And, and we've been working in it for about six years or so, and, and one of the big things was, you know, a couple of UNC graduates are working there and so on. Uh, but developing local leadership and getting people to really focus on an innovation for the intervention and really working on it and then scaling it has been the trick. So some of the programs that have scaled are, we are funding about 60 nonprofits in that area. And, and for example, midday meal, you know, a lot of the kids come hungry to school in India. So this organization built a kitchen, and from that one kitchen, they cook 185,000 meals a day, right? It's 12 cents a meal, local cuisine, local, local uh, produce, fantastic supply chain, management, everything else. So they, once they got it perfected, where $30 feeds a kid for the whole year. Today, in, within four years, they're at 1.3 million kids a day, right? So, so a lot of it is sort of, like Steve was saying, you know, if you look at the for-profit, for-profit is very Darwinian. If you don't behave yourself, if you don't keep the customer happy, you're out of business. So over the course of time, in the for-profit sector, most of the assets are performing assets. In the non-profit sector, the beneficiaries don't have the buying power. And therefore, you could have stranded assets which will just linger on forever. They don't die, right? And so if you bring the execution excellence of the for-profit sector into the non-profit sector, you can create magic. And, and, and that's what we've been working on. And we just brought that program back to Massachusetts in Lower Lawrence. And so 
I'm very excited about you know, taking whatever that new innovation is for the intervention, optimizing it, and then finding a way to scale it. So. And what we found, my wife Jean runs our, uh, the Case Foundation, is that the approach that we bring to bear, whether it's about building businesses or supporting or, or scaling, in some cases starting you know, nonprofits, really is more similar than it is different. And indeed, we've, we've learned over time to identify what problem are we trying to solve and what's the best way to do that? And sometimes it's best done through the prism of a company, sometimes it's best done through the prism of a nonprofit organization. Before, I think, you know, if you asked me 15 years ago, I had to think more of a traditional sense of, well, I guess uh, you're, you spend the first part of your life kind of you know, focusing on, on building companies, in my cases, or building wealth, or what have you, and then the latter part of your life, you're kind of giving back, giving away, sort of, a, sort of almost like throw the money over the, over the wall and then focus on, on, on giving away. I, I, I realized that was, while it may work for some, it's sort of a missed opportunity, that if you can look at it in a more integrated kind of hybrid sort of way, you can have uh, you know, more impact. So how do you build kind of you know, sort of a cause orientation into your business and sort of, so it is more of a social enterprise? And some of the things we're involved in, like a Zipcar, is a social enterprise. It's a business and we're trying to get more members and have people use more cars and, and make money, but it's also a, a, the strategy is how do you revolutionize urbanized, urban living and, and also make it more efficient in terms of college campuses and so forth. There's a, a social purpose to that, even though it's a, it, it's a business. So bringing that philosophy, I think, is, was, was a little eye-opening you know, for us in terms of how we approach things and things like this. Now what we're working on with the White House, the Startup America Initiative, is really a good example of, of how do you bridge those two and you know, Case Foundation along with the Kauffman Foundation uh, and Jess Foundation, many others are really working together to create a, an, an initiative that leverages some of these these principles and, and sometimes brings some of the, the entrepreneurial folks in, sometimes brings sort of the foundation people in, but it's really all t towards the same you know same goal. Yeah, and I'm I'm obviously I'm totally with both of you on this, but what what do we, how do we talk to the people who think that uh, that if if we don't have this Darwinian uh, idea in the for-profit sector, we, if we, we can't, that we, they think we can't bring that same discipline to social enterprises or uh, folks on the other side who say that if we have any kind of profit incentive, eventually the, the social good will, will drift away. How do we convince them that, that, my answer is that the young people like the students who are here tonight have already figured out how to do that, but how do we, how do we convince the uh, other folks that, uh, yeah. that we're gonna be able to do this. You know, I, I think what happens is that the nonprofit guys, um, you know, if, if they don't think about it up front, they create a huge liability for themselves and their life becomes pretty miserable actually because, you know, they do hate competition, they don't like sort of, you know, because they have a huge amount of compassion and they're doing, they're doing something good. But as soon as you talk about competition, they get a little nervous, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when they start doing something and they grow it, then sustainability becomes a huge problem because they get stuck up you know, raising money and it just becomes a real hassle. So any program we start, we say you have to have an exit and the exit can happen one of the three ways. Either a free market economy, some of the programs lend themselves to free market economy, in which case it becomes a, a, a business with a bottom line or it becomes a part of a government program because government spends so much money that sometimes you can bring innovation to the government program and improve that in a big way, or a very broad-based charity, in which case you're raising money from millions of people, in which case you have a very diversified uh, revenue base and you can sustain it. Or in a lot of cases, it's a combination of the three. And, and so, but, but getting that thinking up front, once you get a taste of it, people actually buy into it big time. Because the biggest problem that the nonprofits have is, is actually sustaining themselves. It's very hard. And then, so what happens is they, they have a good year, suddenly some donor comes and gives a lot of money, they, they scale it, and then they can sustain it. And then they have half the money and then the quality drops and then, you know, it just, you get into this negative spiral which you cannot get out of. So getting them to think about the sustainability up front, I think, uh, works. Well, at Summit also, this is obviously part of the work of this uh, National Advisory uh, Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship that we'll be meeting tomorrow, uh, is how do we really, as a nation, celebrate our entrepreneurs? There there's tends to be a, a, 
a little bit of a black mark sometimes associated with business, like somehow business is bad. But business actually is the engine of growth and innovation that drives our economy and arguably you know, is, has driven America. You know, I, I, my view of it is America was founded by entrepreneurs who got on boats and you know, sailed over here trying to find a, you know, kind of a better life and, and create a, you know, a, a kind of a new world. And it's really been the history, if you look at the innovation of the past couple of centuries, that's really what's propelled us into a, the position of leadership in, in the world. And there's some risk to that. I mean, there, there are some concerns in terms of the economy and the deficit and the, the rise of, of other nations that are becoming much more competitive in an intense global world. It's the entrepreneurs that are really the ones that are gonna fight the battle to make sure America stays in a lead, lead position. We have to recognize that and celebrate that. And creating companies that can create hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of jobs is a very important role that needs to be played. So it's not just businesses somehow they're making the money and so forth. They're, they're the ones that are creating the products and services that cre create differentiation uh, ar around the world and create the companies which create the jobs which then support the communities. And w I think people lost sight of that and we need to get the, you know, the focus uh, back on that. And that's part of what we're trying to do is partly trying to accelerate the, you know, the focus of, of startups. It's also a lot of focus on speed ups. How do you take existing companies and and you know, get them to grow more rapidly. And to the, to the point of you know, you know, an idea without execution you know, kind of isn't really much of anything, it's even this notion of finish ups. How do you take these startups and actually get them into being sustainable kind of you know, companies that really are, are part of the, you know, the, the, the ecosystem? So even on the philanthropic side, and I agree with my wife to be part of this giving pledge that you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett uh, started, which I think is a good thing. But the way I looked at it was people who are giving away the majority of their wealth it's not about giving back, it's about giving again, because the companies they created that led to that wealth have already made a positive contribution uh, in the world, and we need to recognize that and celebrate that. Agreed. I think there's uh, lots of students and other folks in the audience who will probably have a question or two, and we've got a microphone uh, down here. So, um, first question from the audience. My name is uh, Floyd, like the hurricane. <laughs> My first name is Ed. I saw in the paper um, recently that I think one of the Koch brothers is building, uh, made a contribution to a building in uh, MIT where they're going to combine biologists and uh, engineers to study disease. They said that uh, scientists are good at discovering the problem, but engineers are better at solving the problem. And you know, I think uh, this may be in line to what you guys uh, are talking about. But um, what do you think about doing something like that around the world or at uh, UNCC? Yeah, no, I think it's, um, you know, this is a, a new center that opened up at MIT, the Koch Center. Um, it's actually pretty fascinating, you know, at MIT, um, you know, previously used to have all these departments, and then they used to survive forever, right? One of the good things MIT did was when they admit students, they like admit a thousand undergraduate students, and the undergraduate students can pick any discipline they want, second year. And so as a result of that, in some ways, it's a little bit of a market force that decides where the stress should be. So that gave a little bit of more ability to react to the marketplace, right? But in the last probably 10 years that I've been at MIT, I've seen an amazing transformation of the, the whole institute there. So you have mechanical, civil, oceanography, biology, physics, chemistry, and the, um, the amazing work that goes on multidisciplinary most of the big innovations are happening in the multidisciplinary thing. So finally, uh, you know, and, and the medicine so far has been very empirical. You know, they do something and collect a lot of data and say, if you did this, it'll cure. But now, the engineers are almost able to start from the basic things and build the whole block, either computationally or otherwise. And so the cancer research center that just opened up, it actually houses half of them are scientists, half of them are engineers. And the engineers actually come from civil, they come from mechanical, they come from chemical, all over the place. 
And, and, and having that multidisciplinary approach to solving problems uh, seems to be a very powerful way of actually, uh, you know, it's a little bit of bringing this relevance and new way of looking at the same problem and solving and so on. So anything you can do to, to bring people together from different perspectives to solve a problem, I think, is a very powerful approach. And there's no question that, that the interface of biology and, and engineering is one that every university is really, really interested in right now. And everybody's got a different way of doing it. And you know, obviously, MIT has a really good one. OK, Clay, you got a question? Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Clay Vickers. I'm a senior English and economics major, and I'm an entrepreneurship minor here at UNC. My question might be more directed to you, Mr. Case. Um, first, thanks for coming. And I want to mention a book that I read once, um, listened to, actually. Um, the Master Switch by Tim Wu. It's about the rise and fall of information technologies. Um, and it kind of ends at its cliffhanger because we don't know whether the internet, will, the internet will stay open or remain closed. And I know you've done a lot of work with um, internet policy, especially at the governmental level. And I feel like one of the, the memes that I, keeps coming up for me is that entrepreneurship um, is in a renaissance in part because of the openness of the internet and the access, um, the free access and the non-discriminatory access. So I was wondering if you can talk about the relationship between the openness of this current most popular information technology and the recent interest in entrepreneurship in our country. It's, it's a, 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 I know Tim, and I think he just joined the FCC to try to kind of play a role in trying to define some of these policies. I think it will end up being pretty open. I think the tension is how do you create incentives for people to invest in certain areas to push things forward where there's some degree of proprietoriness and differentiation, uh, which if you don't have that, then people will not you know, be able to be, or willing to be invest in, in broadband networks and wireless and so forth without having it, the bias shift too much towards things which do kind of essentially limit the, the innovation. Uh, and there are always going to be some of those you know, balancing acts, and uh, ultimately consumers will decide. And actually, you know, there's a lot of uh, companies, Apple in particular, you know, over the last decade has, has really driven uh, their company through innovation but also uh, through relatively tight controls, what some people would call walled garden in terms of you know, how they design their, their, their products and services and their app store and, and, and things like that. Facebook actually is becoming more and more of that as, as well. Uh, and consumers you know, welcome that, and the companies have the ability to innovate within that model while still providing kind of uh, open access. So I think there will always be some tension, but I would be surprised if the core bias of the uh, openness of the core platform didn't remain in place. Um, hello, my name is Angela McCants. I'm the Director of Disabilities Education Center. We're a nonprofit um, organization located in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I wanted to know what advice do you have for a nonprofit who um, is working with youth and trying to create and open their minds and get them to think about innovative ideas? I know I wish that I, I had the program that I have now when I was in high school instead of when I'm in my late 30s, <laughs> actually more than 30, but what kind of advice do you have um, to really open their mind, especially those in the disabilities arena? We're, we're often are left out when it comes to entrepreneurship. Well, you know, I think the, the key thing is to, is to somehow make sure that you have a, a sort of a feedback loop between what you do and, and what the people whom you are trying to help. So for example, we fund a program where uh, it's, a, it's, it's uh, enabling the blind people to get back into the workforce. And in India, there's a lot of call centers. And so can they get into the call center? So actually, it's training them. But every time you train them, if there is a way, they actually give something back. They pay something. You know, it's a, I think it's, a, it's somehow making everybody into a stakeholder is what keeps the quality, I think. You know, every time you come up with a system where you're giving something away for free, you know, sometimes they can't afford to pay anything. That's OK. Maybe after they make money, maybe they'll give something back. But, but somehow making them a part of that thing where they, the people that you help, actually get the right to demand, I think is, is a good concept that I find. So wherever, wherever you have that, as a, particularly as a person who sort of runs the organization, how do you make sure that everybody in the organization really runs the organization so that every beneficiary is empowered? 
right? And the only way you empower them is to make those beneficiaries feel like customers. So if they can give something, then they can sort of demand a good service back from the organization, and that keeps the organization healthy. You were kind of talking about this earlier on, you used the phrase um, stranded assets, uh, which seems like an, an interesting, I'm not sure if it's a, a polite euphemism or if it's, but, but I'd be interested to know more about what, you, what that looks like to you, um, how you identify it, and, and what you do about that when you see it. Well, you know, I think, uh, for example, the number of nonprofits that you have in US, guess how many there are? A million. Right? It's the same thing in India. So in India, for example, what happens is somebody says, I want to start a school. And they'll, they'll raise $10,000. And they'll start a school, and they just can't get it funded. So some of the donor comes and says, you know what? I'll, I'll give you another $10,000, but hospital is more important than school. So he says, OK, in this room, I'll start a hospital. So a lot of these guys, just like a badly managed company, they get into everything. They do everything and nothing they do is good. In the company, the company goes bankrupt. And so the company is gone. But this nonprofit will never go bankrupt. You know, he'll finally have one patient and one, one student, right? <laughs> and he'll, he'll keep going forever. So it, there isn't a way to sort of extinguish the stranded asset in a nonprofit world. So the only way I think you can change that ratio of performing to non-performing assets is, is by, so the way I've been sort of thinking about this is to say, let's pick nonprofits that are really good and you scale them. So if you, have, if you have, let's say, these organizations that can help 10 million, 100 million people, Teach for America, whatever, whatever, you know. So you, you, there, you, you get a few of them which work really well and you scale them big time. And then the performing asset to non-performing asset ratio starts changing. So I don't know how to extinguish the ones that don't work. But I can see how the ones that are working well to really get them working just like a company and scale them. So. Yeah, I think that's an uh, important concept and uh, nonprofit and company side. That we, we, it's always good to have a new idea, but often that nonprofit idea or that for-profit idea could be done someplace else and build on that platform so it gets back into the speed up versus you know, startup kind of mode. And we did some of this with our, our foundation uh, you know, probably eight, nine years ago, you know, identifying organizations like Habitat for Humanity and Special Olympics that had demonstrated a, an interesting model and, and provided capital to essentially help them scale. We could have done, you know, started, I don't know, five or 10 other things kind of replicating what they're doing in a smaller context. We said, no, I actually think in this particular instance, the best use of our capital, best way to have impact is to you know, bet on a winning formula and bring it to even, you know, a wider audience. I think that is a, a key uh, leverage point. I also would point out with this point Desh made on the sustainability of, of nonprofits and not having an over reliant on donors where, you know, donors come and go and priorities come and go and so forth, which obviously is always going to be a core aspect of that. But the extent you can identify a, a business model within that construct that gives you a recurring revenue stream that's not reliant on donors, you almost certainly are going to have more sustainability. And a great example of that, probably the best one, is National Geographic. You know, 100 years ago, they had the idea of basically of nonprofits that we want to basically educate people about the world. And they created the National uh, Geographic magazine and sort of a society and subscription and so forth, and then expanded over time, and now DVDs and the National Geographic cable channel and you know, a bunch of other stuff. Well, it's now they have a billion dollars of businesses that generate significant profit that give them the ability to have a much broader impact on their nonprofit kind of you know, program in terms of schools than they ever would have had if they were you know, holding a, I don't know, a black tie dinner in Washington, D.C. saying, you know, help us educate people about the world. So looking at Special Olympics did that uh, uh, in the late uh, 80s, early 90s with uh, CDs, music uh, Christmas CDs, where, where I think they generated $75 million in revenue from getting artists to basically contribute songs and have a CD every you know, Christmas that was issued that was basically all the money was going to Special Olympics. So looking at ways to build businesses within these nonprofits, which is why this hybrid mentality is so important, gives you the ability to have much more impact and more importantly, even more sustainability because you can kind of count on that after you know, some number of years of it being in place. You know, an opportunity that's open is, is probably to figure out how to do mergers and acquisitions in nonprofit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. but 
But the people who start nonprofit are so passionate. I don't think they'll agree, but if you can figure it out, I think that would be a way to. My name is Ken Morrison. I'm a member of the National Advisory Bigger. Council. Um, <laughs> Desh, you were a, a founding director of the, the Mass Challenge, and Steve, you gave the inspirational talk at the final awards. Is that an example of uh, a nonprofit that, that should be scaled? Actually, I'm going to ask Ping to talk about what you're going to do in North Carolina about it. So, Ping is a, is a local entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur, who is also a member of the, the council. And she, is, she can explain what Mass Challenge is and what she's going to do locally here. Well, Mass Challenge actually was started by a few entrepreneurs who are very passionate about creating new companies. And many of you have seen the statistics that uh, the net job creation are either by new companies or what's called Gazella Company, that UNC actually has a lot of research on that also. Um, so Mass Challenge is only been there, what, 12 one months? Year. One year, right? And they have created uh, how many jobs? Well, you know, they had 435 companies come in. They down-selected 110. And they actually housed these 110 companies, so three, four entrepreneurs every company, in a 25,000 square foot facility that they actually got from a, a, one of the real estate developers there. So having these 110 companies just talk to each other and hang around for four years with about 150 mentors was, was just a, a massively networking opportunity. So out of that, 25 companies are now up and running. So the idea is, can we just do this? And it costs roughly about a million and a half, half a million dollars to run the operations and about a million dollars in prices. So for a million and a half dollars, if you can actually launch 25 companies every year, it just is, is a great way to create that ecosystem. They, they created, the, in, within one year, they had 20 companies that's running, created 500 jobs, raised two, two, uh, $20 million mm -hmm. for those companies. And, and they run a business competition, but actually competition is just a way to find the entrepreneurs who wants to start a business, the key is actually the, it's the incubator and acceleration and also all the volunteers who, who are there to coach those companies. The measurement is how many companies you can create that would actually create jobs and then successfully raise, raise uh, capitals and continue to go. So Mass Challenge is a good example of it can be replicated. It's a success story that can be replicated. So I went up there, um, was that last weekend? Last it was just last weekend. Yeah, Ken actually <laughs> kicked me to go up there to, to look at it. So I did, I went there to look at it. And I was very impressed by it. Uh, we're talking about to have North Carolina as the first state for the rollout, uh, because North Carolina and Massachusetts are very similar. It's a statewide uh, initiative, it's not just in Boston or just in RTP, really you want to reach also to the remote area of the state. And I think North Carolina is a very innovative uh, place. We have a lot of programs. We have a lot of entrepreneurs. We're very high tech centered in RTP. We also have a lot of initiative like uh, Keenan Private Institute is doing wine in the remote area. We also have uh, Kingston that has, you know, the aerospace is moving in, so there's a lot of activity there. But I heard a lot about our parts is better than our sum. So that's like, how can, we, how can we create a program that we can bring all those programs together? And I also heard people say, we really need a Switzerland in, <laughs> of entrepreneurship in North Carolina. I think we have a Switzerland of entrepreneurship in North Carolina. We all are willing to work together. So Mass Challenge is another example of that, uh, some kind of activity that we could do to bring many of the university uh, activities, the mentorship, the young entrepreneurs together, and take a, a model that's already successful and replicate it. So that's, uh, I'm actually right now recruiting someone. Mm -hmm. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of in between jobs or you, you want to run this, come to talk to me. Thanks, Ben. Sally, are you asking a question? Oh, nice to hear. <laughs> jo Jonathan. Very insightful question. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Mills. Can you talk a little bit about the role of social media and philanthropy 
over the last couple of years, whether it was America's Giving Challenge or Pepsi Edit Challenge, American Express had a similar one. It seems to become very popular. It seems to have gotten a little bit quieter lately. Do you think it was a trend, or do you think it's... Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's gotten quieter. I should point out Michael Smith here in the front who handles our social innovation. The Case Foundation has driven a lot of those programs. Just for those who don't know, America's Giving Challenge is a partnership we did with uh, Facebook and Parade Magazine to get people focused on, on, uh, on, on giving. And we've done a number of things with the White House trying to get challenge grants out there and create you know, competition. I actually think it's, it's, it's building. There's some organizations that adopted some of those, those tools early as a way to kind of build an audience that cares about their issue and so forth, but, uh, but others don't really know where to start. So we're doing a lot of you know, training sessions just trying to get people up and running on the basic tools. And for those who are interested, we have a, our, our site, casefoundation.org, a lot of videos and tools, just really kind of like one-on-one stuff to get people, you'd be surprised how many people don't really understand what's happening with social media. Maybe they've heard about Facebook or Twitter or something, but don't really understand it. Uh, and therefore don't really know how to use that as a tool to propel their, 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 their mission forward. So I think we're kind of in the second inning in terms of the adoption of those technologies by most, uh, most organizations. It's actually true with big companies as well, not just, not just nonprofits. One last question from the audience. Yeah, right here. Right. Tom Egan, uh, I'm wondering if both of you can comment right. on the impact of the American healthcare system on entrepreneurship. You came from Toronto and as an entrepreneur, No, I agree. I think it's a, it's a big cost. But again, the opportunity to reduce the cost is an opportunity for entrepreneurs. You know, I think, I think there'll be a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities if, if we open up that sector a little bit more and, and get people to use technology and, and, and a lot of the new things to actually get the cost under control, I think. Yeah, I think the, the core issue is a lot of the debate around healthcare in our country the last several years has really been about who pays. You know, they, they shifting the debate, hopefully in the future, to how do you provide better care at lower costs, and particularly how do you keep people healthier longer? That's really the, the leverage on the prevention kind of wellness side, as well as how are you much smarter in terms of diagnosing things and dealing with chronic disease and managing it before things really get out of hand and you have people in the emergency room and being much more targeted and smart about dealing with you know, life-threatening disease, cancer, and, and so forth. Uh, there are really three different parts of the, of the healthcare system. They all lend themselves, I think, to new models and can use technology and, I think, consumerism as ways to kind of drive them forward. It's not going to happen overnight because our, our system really has now for more than half a century been, been really dominated by a, a payment infrastructure where the government pays or the employer pays, not consumer pays. So consumers really have kind of outsourced this to other people. That's beginning to change, particularly on the wellness side. Consumers are starting to buy different products and services. Uh, and it's quite exciting, particularly in the area of mobile health, to see what, what happens there. I think there'll be a, a, really a next five years a lot of innovation around mobility with, with smartphone devices and different kinds of you know, healthcare uh, products uh, and services. So I think there can be some, some innovation. You know, well, the debates will continue about you know, how to share the cost, and it's going to become even more acute with the, the deficit debate and you know, Medicare and so forth. Uh, but you know, the entrepreneurs can, as Desh was saying, focus on the other side of the, the equation, which is how do we create innovative products and services that provide better care at, at lower costs and keep people healthier longer and out of expensive you know, kind of emergency rooms when there's better settings to you know, deal with that. And the best setting of all sometimes in the home and being able to diagnose something just before it happens and deal with it proactively as opposed to kind of you know, after, after the fact. So it, it's, I think it's going to be one of the great entrepreneurial opportunities over the next decade is, is really trying to help revolutionize our healthcare system. And that's a good intro into my last question. I mean, I think everybody here uh, would love to know. I know I, I've, I've got a tablet and a smartphone, and I'm on Twitter. Uh, and I learned about Groupon this weekend, which seems like a cool thing. Uh, we've got Zipcar on our campus. Each of, each of you uh, tell us what's, what's next. What's the next big thing that, that you see coming that, that is exciting, that would change the world as, as much as the things that I just, just said? Well, you know, I think entrepreneurial opportunities are very much like 
looking for a spouse or looking for a house, you know? <laughs> They're everywhere, but it's hard to find the one that you really want. <laughs> and, and then so, <clears throat> so, but, but I think, uh, so for an entrepreneur, that's always a challenge because you have to jump off the cliff and then right. how do you know, right? But I, th I think the, the general themes of sustainability, energy, you know, I'm doing a company called A123 Systems, which is electrification of the transportation system, weaning ourselves off from oil. Uh, a lot of these big themes, you know, life sciences and clean water, clean air, a lot of these problems absolutely have to get solved. And so uh, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of opportunities. You know, I think life is going to change dramatically over the next 20 years. And every change is going to be led by an entrepreneur. So I don't think there's going to be any lack of entrepreneurial opportunities. Needless to say, I agree with that. I would just add that uh, from my perspective, uh, the last 25 years, uh, particularly focused on the technology side of things, has really been kind of the first internet revolution, Get, just getting everybody connected, you know, getting those PCs or devices and networks and now mobility and so forth. So it went from 25 years ago, virtually nobody used it, and the people did use it, used it an hour or two a week. That was our early customers, that was the typical usage uh, you know, profile, to now virtually everybody uses it and they use it all the time. Maybe too much, but that's a whole other right, topic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but it's now become ubiquitous and and and, and mobile. So that's sort of the first uh, internet revolution. Yeah, you know, check. I think in terms of what we were trying to create 25 years ago, I think we've we've uh, largely achieved, which creates an interesting opportunity for the next 25 years, which I think of as the second internet revolution, which is not so much about internet businesses, but how do you use the internet and its ubiquity and mobility to really revolutionize every other part of you know living. Uh, and that's why healthcare, I think, is such an opportunity. Part of the interest in, in Zipcar was that. It's, you could argue it's transportation, it's a car. It's only possible because of the internet. In terms of knowing the cars and having a device, you can walk down the street and find the car and book it and go walk up to the car and open the car up and, 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 and kind of drive it away. How do you create those kinds of, of opportunities in, in healthcare or financial services or, or travel or, or local commerce or or uh, transportation, I think that's going to be the exciting thing to watch in, in the next 25 years. So we, we, we've kind of, we, we've, although there's still a lot of innovation in the internet and, and social, you know, social media is certainly you know, one of the you know, major ones, the local GPS-driven services or you know, mobility is going to be a, a big deal. I think it's more interesting not just to focus on the internet as a sector, but how you take that technology and infuse it in every other sector and that's where I think the next big companies are going to be created. Thanks again to Steve Case and Desh Deshpande for taking the time to share their insights with the Carolina community. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with these two American innovators. Thanks for watching.